I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56. Thursday morning, I believe it was, I had, um, it maybe it was Friday morning, I had been at the hospital that night, I'd gotten home kind of late and, and uh, got ready to go to bed, it was after midnight and I laid down and, and uh, I was just praising and worshiping the Lord for a little while and all of a sudden the Lord really began to minister to me and talk to me. Now you don't have to believe that if you want to, but I know what happened to me and what happened for me and the Lord began to just speak some things into my heart, so when I say to you this morning that this message came right from the Holy Spirit. You can write it down. You can stand on it. You can claim it. In fact, I believe that what I'm going to tell you this morning, if you'll just listen to me, it is going, if you'll, if you'll put your faith in this story, if you'll put your faith in what the Lord did in this story, if you'll put your faith in what the Lord did in this story, it's going to fix everything. Everything that you need between now and the end of this year. How many believe it? October, November, December. You got a little over 90 days. Then we're going to believe God that every victory, every healing, every manifestation, every turnaround, every breakthrough. Come on, you're not here for a breakdown. You're here for a breakthrough. You're not here for your mess to get bigger. You're here to hear a message to give you a miracle to get you up out of your mess in the name of Jesus. And you know by now you're strong enough that most of your stuff doesn't come directly just at you. It has to be coming through somebody else. Somewhere else your attack has been coming. Through somebody else something has kind of messed with you. But if God be for you, a a thousand, a thousand shall fall at my side. A thousand shall fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, but not one shall come nigh me. 10,000 shall fall at my heart, but not one, not one, not one shall come nigh me. Woo! Somebody give God a crazy praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not one. How many of y'all glad about not one? I mean, that's some crazy stuff. I, th I think I need to go in another room and have a shouting spell just thinking about that. Glory to God. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Now thanks be unto God that gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen. And the story that I'm going to give you is pure victory through Jesus. Let's go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, beginning in verse 45. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 45. The story that I'm going to preach about this morning, if you want to write this down, it's also found in Matthew 14, 22, and in John 6, 15. Let me give that to you again in case you want to write those down and read all three from Matthew, Mark, and John, their versions about this particular miracle. Matthew 14, 22, or John 6, 15. We're going to be reading from Mark 6, 45. This message, this story today is so powerful. Let's listen. Let's let God minister to us. Let the Lord give us the victory in it in the name of Jesus. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, which while he sent the people away. Verse 46. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. Verse 46. And when even was come, that's six o'clock, when even was come, the ship was in the middle of the sea, and he alone on the land. Verse 48. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. About the fourth watch of the night, he comes to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. Verse 49. But when they saw Jesus walking on the sea, See, they supposed. You got to be careful what you suppose. Supposing is a very low form of knowledge. You can't suppose you've got to know. 
Come on, somebody say amen. They supposed that it was a spirit or it is where we get the word phantom, fantasia. It's where we get the word for ghost or phantom. They thought it was a phantom. That's their imagination. They thought it was a phantom and they cried out, verse number 50, for they all saw him and they were troubled and immediately he talked with them and said unto them, be of good cheer, it is I, be be not afraid. Say that with me. Be not afraid. Verse 51. And he went up into them, into the ship. The wind ceased, and they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure, and they wondered. Verse 52. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Say those last words with me. For their heart was hardened. Lord, I ask you to give us insight, give us revelation, give us instruction, give us ears to hear, give us an unction to function in this particular story. You said we have an unction from the Holy One and we would know all things, First John. So we ask you for hearing ears, anoint our ears, anoint our mind, anoint our heart in the name of Jesus and let faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God and let us walk out of this place stronger than we walked in in the name of the holy child Jesus give us the weaponry today give us the instruments today give us the wherewithal today to win every battle to defeat every enemy to walk in victory in the rest of this year in Jesus mighty name somebody shout amen I'm believing for God I even brought two hankies today that's how much I'm believing God Somebody say amen. amen. I don't have time to read this story in Matthew, Mark, and John, but let me give you some instruction. The Bible says that when this started, it's after Jesus had multiplied the loaves and the fishes, and after the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, if you read the story, you'll find out that that miracle was so big that all the people that ate wanted to make him king. Yeah. They wanted to rise up and make Jesus king. They wanted to actually create an army, go into Jerusalem and kick the Romans out. They wanted Jesus to become king. And this miracle was so power packed that I even think in Jesus, with Jesus, it so astounded him that he knew that his ministry now was taking on more power, more might, more victory. You said, Pastor, that's hard to imagine. But read the Bible, Jesus grew in wisdom and knowledge. He learned obedience. So when the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes came and this huge miracle and 12 baskets full, Jesus sent the people away, told the disciples and constrained them or compelled them to get into a ship and go to the other side. Let's talk just a minute, how many are you with me, about him having to compel them or talk them into it. Why? Because they were most of them were professional fishermen. And they could see in the north, where they are in the north of the Galilee, in the north of Israel and they're going to cross the other side and go to Bethsaida. I've been there a lot of times. It is the north part of the Sea of Galilee. They're just going to crisscross. It's just, it's just a very short. It should take them only maybe an hour or an hour and a half at the most to cross the Galilee at this particular place. But he's having to compel them because they see that a storm is coming. How many you with me? Say amen. They can see that a storm is coming, but he's compelling them. I need you to go to the other side. They see this storm coming, and God's giving them instruction to go to the other side. Can I tell you that any time you see a storm coming, that Jesus is trying to get you to go ahead and go to the other side? Come on. Jesus doesn't listen to me. He doesn't want you to run from Goliath, run from the fiery furnace, run from the storm. He wants to compel you to get out there and watch his power give you the victory over the fiery furnace, the victory over the giant, and the victory over the storm. Now, thanks be unto God that gives me victory. Hmm. Be uh, in the world, you will have a little tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have. Mm -hmm. 
I want to say that again. I have overcome the world. Is anybody in this place? Anybody going through a storm? Anybody facing a storm? Anywhere in your life? You got a kid going through a storm. You're going through it maybe in your marriage, in your body, at work, financially. How many with me? Say amen. They can see a storm a coming. If you listen to the news, they're talking about a financial storm's coming. If you look over at Syria and around the world, you hear all kinds of storms. In the last days, there'll be wars and rumors of wars and signs and wonders and pestilence. All of those are storms. But the Bible says when you see all this, that we're to stand in the holy place. Glory to God, when you stand in the holy place, that means you're having fellowship with the holy God. And if you're having fellowship with the holy God, everything's going to be all right. So he compels them. Everybody say that with me. He compels them. They can see that. They can see up in the sky the dark clouds rolling in. They can see. They can feel the wind. They can. They can see that a storms are coming. But he has to compel them. I want you to go to the other side. I'm not going with you. Hallelujah. How many know that when Jesus wasn't going with him, he had to even compel them just a little bit more. I'm not going. I gotta stay here and pray. I gotta. I gotta kind of figure out how this. How this miracle of five loaves and two fishes. I gotta. I got to figure out where I am and what's going on. Mm. Sometimes you just got to break loose and go up on some kind of secret mountain top and you got to say, oh Lord, I know you're doing something. What are you doing in me? What are you doing around me? Come on, come on, somebody say amen. Sometimes you got to figure out that your anointing is now increasing and your victory now is beginning to manifest and you got to get ready for it. I don't know if it's true, but I heard that everybody that wins the lottery basically ends up bankrupt in a few years because they, they really don't know what to do with that much money. Hallelujah. They need to give it to my wife. How many of y'all love me? Say amen. It's because they don't know what to do with it. And so, so because they don't know what to do with it. How many of you with me say amen? Sometimes we come to church and we don't even know what to do with that Sunday. We read some scriptures and we don't even know what to do with them. We don't realize that they are life to those that find it and health to all their flesh. And sometimes you just need to get up on a mountaintop spiritually and say, oh my God, I believe you're increasing my anointing. You're increasing your presence. You're, you're increasing the victory in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Can I stop and tell you a secret? Can I preach something to you? Anytime you have some spiritual time, your body will react and it wants some of its time. Anytime you've had time with God, the devil will react. He wants to spend some time with you in fear and doubt and worry and symptom and trouble and all kinds of chaos and confusion because the devil is a, devil, a jealous devil and he wants that time. Come on, he wants that time. That's why many times people go to Bible college, read the Bible, so they become a teacher. They become a praise and worship leader and when they get up older in life, they don't understand what's going on. The devil wants wants his time. He wants some time on their life, but you tell him, no, you can't have time in my life. You can't have time in my body. You can't have time in my mind. I want you to listen to me. How do things happen to the righteous? It's because sometimes their mind is over here wondering what people are thinking about them, worried about this and contemplating that and scared of this and fearful of that and all their mind is all out here and all of this other kind of stuff and they wonder how that got into their body, that got into their life, it got in through their mind. Oh, but if you keep the mind of Christ, come on, Satan can enter into your life through your spirit, he has to do it through your your mind or through your body. That's why you've got to keep your mind the mind of Christ and you've got to keep your body crucified with Christ and deny yourself and take a... <laughs> Hallelujah. Sooner or later, can I preach to you a little while? This wasn't in my plans, but I got next Sunday to finish. Glory to God. Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? I've got to walk this thing through. I've got to live it. I've got to walk by faith 
and not by sight. Come on, come on. I've got to make sure that with mischief, listen, the Bible says mischief will get in your feet. Mischief will get in your hands. And if mischief settles in your feet and in your hands, you got to make sure that after you went over and you, you did that, that you cut it off with the blood. You cut off that power of that mischief with the blood. You say, no, I'm not going to let that mischievousness in my hands. I'm not going to let it in my feet. I'm not going to let that stuff be in my life. Where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. Now you listen to me. When I do wrong, the law can abound. And if the law abounds, then I'll get in condemnation. If I do wrong, two things will abound, law or grace. If the law abounds and I let the law abound, I'll get into condemnation. Mm. But if I let grace abound, I'll get out from under condemnation. Sin is a law. That's why your willpower can never overcome it. Sin is a law. And you cannot outlast it with your willpower. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes me free from the law of sin and death. And the grace of God is greater than all law, all sin, all mistakes, all sicknesses, all diseases, and all failure. Because grace is not a doctrine, it's a person. And his name is Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. Somebody give God a crazy praise. <laughs> so he constrained his disciples seeing that a storm was coming knowing that Jesus wasn't going to be with them come on knowing that Jesus wasn't going to be with them that's what their mentality was because even when they came they had a, some kind of a, 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 a ghost of mentality a, a, some kind of something crazy in their minds because the moment they saw the storm the moment they knew that Jesus wasn't going to be there all of a sudden they begin to fall apart because they didn't realize that he had already told them how to stop a storm peace be still are you with me? Storms come all the time. I want to say that again. Storms come all the time. You can be in church right now. You've been praising God. There's peace all over you because we prayed into this place. But you, by three o'clock this afternoon, there can be a storm. By four o'clock tomorrow, there can be a storm. Come on, a storm's gonna try to come. Can I get a witness in this place? Gonna try to come and mess with you. So Jesus goes up on the mountain. He's praying. He's praying because of, there's been a change. There's been an increase of the miraculous. There's been an increase because he's getting closer, closer to his death burial and resurrection he's got to be able to do endure the cross and his strength is growing his power is growing the miracle manifestation is growing somebody help me the, the farther we grow in God the stronger we ought to be getting the farther the longer we serve him the sweeter he grows the longer we serve him the sweeter he grows we should not be giving up giving in and giving out by now huh we all appreciate it. Say amen. amen. The Bible says it's about six o'clock in the evening. Jesus goes aside. The disciples go out into the storm that's coming. And if you read the Bible, it says they're out there now in the middle of it. It's just to cut across the tip. It's to cut. I've studied this thing so big that they would just be cutting across from a northern extreme to the other extreme over here. Just a little cut across the very top. But now they are in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. The wind is so boisterous and so violent. The waves are so big it's carried them off their journey, carried them away from their destination, carried them away from the northern corner till now they're right out in the middle of the, of the Sea of Galilee. During this time, Jesus has come down from the mountain. He's standing there. He's standing there and he watches them according to what I can study for nine solid hours. He stands on the side of the shore waiting for somebody to call him, waiting on somebody to mention his name, waiting on somebody to plead the blood, Come, waiting on somebody to call out. Hallelujah, because he answers prayer. 
for nine hours if I can submit to you that nobody in the boat, they just toil in rowing. Nobody in the boat cries out his name. Nobody in the boat speaks a word. Nobody in the boat says anything to pull on the Lord Jesus because Jeremiah said if we would call upon him, he would answer us and show us great and mighty things. Somebody shout amen. amen. Their problem was as they were tolling and rowing, they were captured by the storm. At the fourth watch of the night, let me explain the watches. The first watch is from six o'clock in the evening, and there I gave you the scripture even. Six o'clock in the evening, six o'clock in the evening. The first watch is from six to nine o'clock in the evening. The second watch is from nine o'clock in the evening to 12 o'clock midnight. The third watch is from 12 o'clock midnight to three o'clock in the morning. The fourth watch of the night is from three o'clock to six o'clock in the morning. In Israel, by six o'clock in the morning the sun is risen up. It is the darkest hour. Jesus waits. He stands there. Nobody's asking. Nobody's calling. Nobody's crying. Nobody's in faith. Nobody's speaking the word. Nobody's doing anything but toiling and rowing because the wind is contrary to them. Opposite of what they're to do. Opposite of where they're to go. Opposite of what they are to have. Are you right now in a situation that it seems like you have opposite of what God has promised you. Is anybody in this place? Finally, everybody say finally. Finally, almost six o'clock in the morning after Jesus, according to what I've been able to study in Matthew, Mark, and John, after nine hours, nine hours of him standing on the shore, nine hours of him watching them lose their direction, go away from the appointed direction, move away through the wind, through the waves, after nine hours, Jesus steps into the storm. Anybody here? After nine hours, Jesus steps into the storm. How many of y'all with me say amen? amen? After nine hours. Say that again with me. After nine hours. Sometimes people say to me, Pastor, you say the same scriptures to us all the time. Yes, I hope you get so tired of them that you'll remember them. Pastor, you've been using 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but now is it in your mind? Is it on your mouth? It is in your heart? Is it in your steps? It is in your hands? By now, is it if you feel something wrong, are you saying, but now thanks be unto God that gives me the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, instead of shedding a thousand tears, by the time you've shed 10 or 15 tears, you're wiping them off your face and say, wait a minute. Now, thanks be unto God that gives me the victory through my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody say amen. I'm going to get the victory in my life. I'm going to get the victory in my body. Jesus Christ paid the price. I am healed. I am more than a conqueror. Greater is he that's in me. Somebody say amen. I want you to hear this clearly. After nine hours, he walks into the storm. He walks into the storm. The Bible says, I read it to you. They see him and they think it's a ghost. They think it's some phantom. They're not expecting the Lord. They're not looking for the Lord. Why? Because the storm now has all their attention. Are you with me? Are you with me? Even now, there are people out there that have been told Jesus doesn't heal. Jesus doesn't deliver. That must be God's will. I tell you what, I listen to people on the TV sometimes at the news talking about their family members going through something and they're saying this must be God's will. No, it's not. He's a loving God. He's a loving Father. He's a loving God. He's a loving Father. Those bad things are not from God. They're from an enemy. They're the curse. God's good. Every good and perfect gift comes down from God. There's no such good thing as leukemia. Cancer's not no good. Sickness is not no 
good. Death and destruction are no good. Fighting and fussing is no good. Wars are no good. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Say it with me. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. But the enemy knew he could sneak that lie in. And we would say, oh, God must have done this. God's giving this to me. God's doing this. No, it's not God. If God be for you, who, what, when, where, and how can be against you? Huh? Are you with me? That's my mother right there. She's been my mother for 83 years. That's my mother. I would not want her to be my mother. I would not want her to be my mother if she would give me and inflict me with sickness and disease. I would not want her coming over to my house and say, Randy, I love you so much, but here I want to inflict you with sickness. I want to inflict you with disease. I want to give you something wrong. Come on, come on. I'm going to give you something wrong. I want to tell you, Randy, that I've got a plan tomorrow that when you're driving down the road that I'm going to have a drunk on the other end. He's going to drive into your vehicle. He's going to crash. You're going to be paralyzed for the rest of your life. I did it. I planned it. I'm working it out. Come on, somebody say amen. The Bible says if we know how to give good gifts unto our children, how much more shall the Father which is in heaven give good things to those that ask him? Can I? I'm just going to tell you a little bit. You can raise your shout up just a little bit. You can be more like a glorious church if you want to with me this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Are you afraid to step up and really believe? Are you afraid? Are you afraid? Is your mind so it is so messed up some that you say, I can't step up to that level. You're going to have to step up to that level because all things are possible to them. Everything. Everything. If it's impossible, it's doable. If it's impossible, it becomes doable if you believe God. If it's impossible, it becomes doable if you trust God. We used to sing the song when I was young, and he will do what no other power can do. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Jesus walks out on the wind, the sea, the storm. He just walks out. If you read your Bibles, and all of a sudden they see him. I'm not going to talk about Peter and his conversation of Peter saying, Lord, if it's you, bid me come. I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is you seeing the scriptures that when Jesus steps in the boat, when Jesus steps inside the boat, the moment that Jesus steps in the boat, enters into the boat, they receive him into the boat instantly automatically instantly the wind instantly stops the waves instantly stop instant when he steps in in an instant it stops could it be that he's already stepped into your heart and the very storm that you see is not in your heart the very storm that you're going through is not in your heart because he's in your heart Therefore, there's no storm in your heart. Oh, but there can be a storm in your mind because right now you're letting that mess into your mind and you need to let Jesus in your mind. Could it be that your heart is still at peace? Your heart is still standing strong, but the storm's out here in your body. The storm's in your marriage. The storm's in your finance. And it wants to unsettle your spirit. It wants you to get a little bit afraid. And you have belief here and unbelief here. Come on. When you have believing here and unbelief here, this unbelief here can mess with this believing down here. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Are y'all out there? This is the part I have to gird. Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end for the revelation that is to be brought to you at the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Transformed by the renewing of my mind. Amen. I get what's inside me to the outside of me through my mind. Through my mind. My mind is the holes. My mind is the tunnel. My mind is the channel that everything in my heart flows through my mind. That's why I've got to have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you which was in Jesus so that the victory that's 
in my heart will flow through my thoughts, be in my emotion. Hallelujah. The, if ye then be risen with Christ, if ye then be risen with Christ, Colossians 3, 1, set your mind on things above and not on those things on the earth for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. You got to set your mind. You got to set your mind. Come on, come on. Your spirit is only alive if Jesus Christ is in it. Jesus is the life of your spirit. Somebody says, I don't know the difference between Jesus and my spirit. Is it Jesus or my spirit? If it's coming from your spirit, baby, it's Jesus. He's the voice of your spirit. He's the life of your spirit. Your spirit was dead and trespassing and sin, but the spirit of adoption stepped inside there, raised your spirit up from the dead. Now you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're a spiritual creature. You're born again of the incorruptible seed, the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. You can be sick on the outside, but you can't be sick in your spirit. Your spirit never gets sick. Your spirit never dies. Your spirit can't get cancer. Your spirit can't get leukemia. Your spirit can't can't be hurt. You just have to neglect it. I mean, y'all love me anyhow. Say amen. amen. The moment he steps on, the moment he steps on, throw up those scriptures. Listen to this. I want to give you this, the the story in in in. In Mark chapter, I mean, pardon me, Matthew chapter 14, verse 32 and 33. We're going to look at each three endings from Matthew, Mark, and John. This is Matthew 14, 32, and 33. And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Yeah. The moment he stepped into the ship, the wind ceased. Yeah. How many of y'all believe that? Yeah. Can I get that then for you to put that into your heart? That the moment he stepped into your heart, yeah. the wind ceased. In your spirit. I've got a secure place. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High God. My spirit is at peace with God. Somebody else may be fighting with you on the outside. Somebody else may be pushing you on the outside. But there's God in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Can I get a witness? It's on the inside. Everybody say, it's in me. Christ in me. The moment he stepped into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, of the truth, you are the Son of God. When he stepped into that boat, the wind, and a mo- I mean instantly, there was a huge wave and then no wave. Instantly it stopped. Instantly it stopped. Instantly it ceased. Instantly nine hours of hell on earth was completely over when he stepped into the boat. Can I submit to you that when he stepped into your heart, you've got a place that there is no storm. You've got a place that there is no storm. But now you got to let him step in your mind. And now you got to let him step into your emotions. Now you got to let him step into your feelings. Now you got to let him step into your body. Now you got to let him to step into that stuff on the outside. Anybody going to help me out now? You got to let him do it. I was called to pray for a little child. The, the, the parents got up one morning and they walked in there and the little boy was in a coma and there was vomit all over the little, the little bed of the little boy and he was in a coma and instantly they called an ambulance, 911. They came and got the boy and took him to the hospital. They called me on the phone and when I got there, there were nurses taking turns keeping the little boy's heart regulated, keeping that little heart pumped. And they said, man, it looks like he has uh, spinal meningitis and it's really a bad thing. And if he can live the first 24 hours, maybe he'll have a chance, but he'll probably be blind the rest of his life. He, he may be a vegetable. I mean, they were just telling the parents all this kind of stuff. And so I walked into the hospital and, and into the hospital room and they just let me stay because this was life or death. They just let me stay in there, hallelujah. And so I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, just stand there and speak the word of God. Just stand there and speak the word of God. I spoke every scripture I know. I probably even messed some of them up. I even said Jesus wept. 
I said every scripture. I just stood there and spoke the word of God. Spoke the word of God. I spoke it till I was tired. I was physically exhausted. I spoke it 12, 14 hours solid. Just the word of God coming out of my mouth. When the 24 hours were up, the boy was still alive. The doctor said he'll be blind. His brain's probably messed up from this temperature way above 104, 105. It's no telling what this child, the condition of this child is going to be like. This was years ago. But I I'd spoken the word of the living God. The next day I got up and went and spoke the word of God. Then the doctor said, we checked his eyes. His eyes are perfect. We've checked everything we can check. His kidneys are perfect. Everything is perfect. Everything is perfect. That boy is now grown up and he's preaching the gospel. He pastors the church. God healed him and delivered him. God healed him and delivered him. God healed him and delivered him. A storm came into that boy's room, but peace be still, peace be still. Somebody say it with me. Peace be still. Come on. Somebody shout it with me. Peace be still. Give God a crazy praise. The enemy sees us go to work and all this stuff going on, all this stuff. He sees how we react to situations and circumstances. You know, and I understand it's just a part sometimes of human nature to cry, to fall apart, to give in, to give out, to say, oh God, to question God. The school of hard knocks, how many with me? It just this, 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 this. But you've got to understand he stepped inside your heart just like he stepped into the boat and there is no storm. There is no sickness. There is no disease. There is nothing in your spirit. There is nothing in your spirit but the things of God. It was dead, now it's alive. It's alive unto God. It's alive unto God. Christ in you, you're alive unto God. There is never a storm in your spirit. Can I get somebody, can I get somebody to know you've got peace like a river. Peace I leave with you. It's in your spirit. It's in your heart. It's in your spirit. It's in you. It's in you. It's in your boat. It's in your spirit. Come on. Anybody going to help me? So when it's out on the outside, when it's in your mind, when it's in your body, you still have a secret place, an untouchable place steadfast, unremovable place. Come on. you still got a place. That's where you are. Come on. <laughs> That's why you say, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Christ in me, the hope of this glory, the hope of the glory of my, of my healing, the hope of the glory of my getting through this. Christ in me, the hope of the glory, the hope, the expectation that the glory is going to come, the glory is going to manifest, the glory is going to answer. Hallelujah. Almost through. Mark 6, 51. He went up to them in the ship. The wind ceased. They were so amazed in themselves beyond measure. Beyond measure. I studied every one of these words. You ought to see me last night. I had the books all over the place. My little dog come in there and looked at me, saw all them books and just walked out. She knew she wasn't going to get no petting, no loving. Just had them books laid out. I studied every individual word. And I, I want to know what this sore is. I don't know what sore amazed is. And it, and it, it expresses itself in this, in a, such a wonderment, such, a, such an absolute wonder, an awe, such an absolute thrill that hit their lives. I mean, it was overwhelming. And their joy became as big as the storm was bad. Yeah. Now their expressions were greater than the expressions of their fear and their worry and the thoughts and the toiling and the stuff that was against them. Now they exhibited the joy and the victory greater than the worry and the fear. That's one of the great keys that your shouting becomes greater than your worry. If you spent 20 days worrying about it and only 20 minutes shouting over it, you're a little out of whack. <laughs> I know I ain't lying. If I'm lying, he's fine. I'm going to love Jesus. Let's look in John's gospel. Let's finish this up. Then they willingly received him into the ship. Woo. And immediately 
the ship was at land where they were supposed to go. Not only did the wind cease instantly, the waves stop instantly, but they were way off course. They were in the middle of the Galilee, and now all of a sudden they're right on the place that they should have been. Instantly the storm ceased, but there was another miracle. Instantly they were where they should have been all along. I will restore to you the years, the very time. All that time that you were off course, instantly you're on course. Right instantly. Listen to this. Let's say God tells me to take 20 steps and turn left. How many know that if I take 20 steps and I turn left, I'm going to get blessed? I'm in the will of God. But let's say that I'm a little bit rebellious and he tells me to take 20 steps and turn left and I take five and turn right. How many with me say amen? How many know that right there I'm out of God's will? As a Christian, I'm still, he's still in me. But I'm out of his obedient action. He's still in me. Come on. So what do I do at that particular moment? Do I have to back up? Sorry. You chose to sit on the front row. And then start all over? No. Right here. Five steps in right. Lord, I'm just going to go ahead and ask you to forgive me and I'm just going to give you the praise and the glory. I am automatically back in the will of God. Because it says in everything, not for it, in it give thanks. Because that's the will of God and that puts me back into the will of God. When I stop walking wrong, when I stop thinking wrong, when I stop falling apart, when I stop giving up, giving in, giving out, and just start praising God, I'm in the will of God. No matter what I've done. Anybody going to give God a crazy praise? I'm in the will of God. I'm in the will of God. Shout it with me. I'm in the will of God. Come on. I'm in the will of God. I am in the will of God. There is something that can get you out of the will of God. There's something, and maybe it really doesn't, but it so messes with your conscience. Right. When your conscience is being condemned, God is greater than your heart. Yeah, Say that with me. God is greater than my heart. You've ought to always remember God is greater than your feelings, greater than your heart, greater than condemnation. You've got to always make God greater than everything you feel, everything you think, everything you're going on. God is greater than your heart. He's greater than that condemnation. He's greater than that stuff. Oh, God, you're greater. I'm beating myself up, but you're greater than this. And grace abounds and God's greater. And they were stunned. They marveled. It overwhelmed them. Why? Because it's just Jesus stepping into the ship. Can I submit to you that when Jesus steps in, can I convince you that he has already stepped into you if you are saved? He is in you. Everybody say, he's in me. But you can have Jesus in your spirit and you can have craziness in your mind. A Christian cannot be demon possessed, but a Christian can have a devil moving on their body and talking to their mind. You cannot have Jesus and the devil in your heart at the same time because there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing there for that to happen. How many you with me? Say amen. So if you've got Jesus in your heart and worry in your mind is from the enemy, and what you've got to do is let Jesus step into that boat Step into that mind. Step into that thing. Come on. Come on. Are you with me? All they would have had to have done in that nine hours is call out to him. And he would have come right then. He would have come right then. Come on, somebody say amen. I said he would have come right then. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask my wife to go play this song.
specifically for me. Hallelujah to God. In the presence of Jehovah, God Almighty, Prince of Peace, troubles vanish, hearts are mended in the presence of the King. This morning I got up this morning and I noticed that when I got up, if I'd have had a faucet, I'd have turned it off because I was, it's like my sinuses were kind of crazy this morning. And I said, I'm not going to tolerate this. I said, Jesus, you're even in my sinus cavities. Have you with me? Say amen. You're so much in me. You're so much in me. I speak four times a week. For years, my wife will tell you I preached at least 325 times a year all over the country. 325, that's a lot of times for a preacher to preach. 325 times. I spent five years and never took a vacation, just preached and preached and preached and preached and preached. And not one time did my voice give me any trouble. Not one time did anything mess up because I believe that Jesus is in my How many believe Jesus is in you right now? Come on, say it with me. Jesus is in me right now. Jesus is in me. A few weeks, a few months ago, Marcus called me on the phone. Marcus and Brianna. You remember they came to the church out on Buffalo Gap Road. Brianna could not have a child. Every time she'd get pregnant, she'd lose it. And the doctor said, forget it. You will never have a child. Brianna walked up to me and said, Pastor, I want you to quit praying for me. In fact, if you do, I will walk out. That's what Brianna said to me. She got so angry at me. I remember the first time they ever came to church, they had a knockdown, drag out fight in the parking lot. And I walked out there to where they were. They don't mind me telling you this. They're probably watching it. Hallelujah to God. And I went out there and spoke the word of God to them and God healed it. And that's why they started coming to Victory Church. They stayed with me for what? Five, six, seven years. Finally, all of a sudden, she got pregnant and she had a baby. I want to tell you that just a few months ago, they called me on the phone. I dedicated their fifth child over the phone. I said, Marcus, hold up that child. He said, Pastor, while I'm holding it up, will you pray that we stop having babies? <laughs> they have been gone now. He was in the military. They went over to Okinawa. They have been gone from the church, what, five, six years now? But it never fails. Every couple of months, they call me on the phone. Pastor, thank you. They're in a church up in uh, Utah that runs two, 3,000 people. He went to his pastor and said, how come you don't preach healing? He said, I don't believe in it. I don't believe God heals anymore. He called me on the phone. He said, Pastor, I want to thank you for the foundation that you gave me. He said, in the church that we go to, it's huge. It's the biggest church in town. It's huge. But they don't believe in anything hardly at all about the move of God, the gifts of the Spirit, healing, miracles, signs, and wonders. He said, it's the most unbelievable thing how thousands of people can come. And yet they are told that it's God's will for you to get sick. It would be God's will for you to have that. That God is giving that to you. He said, Pastor, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Ladies and gentlemen, it is unbelievable. That's why people have no belief. Look at me. It's based upon what we've been told about it. We're destroyed by lack of knowledge. Anybody going to agree with the preacher boy? We're destroyed by lack of knowledge. But the Bible says, they that follow on to know the Lord, he will come to them like rain. In the presence of Jehovah, God Almighty, God Almighty, All my troubles vanish. <laughs> Hearts of Did you text my wife about your aunt? I remember that we've been we've been standing with sister Betsy and for her sister I got a text this week from her about your sister sister Betsy 
sister and her aunt. How many know that we've been standing with her because that she had leukemia? She was really, she was dying. And I want her, you'll have to speak loud, but to give the testimony of what you text me about this week. Father, how many of you believe with Father in Jesus' name, we command that 5% to leave this morning in Jesus' name. No 5%. There's no such thing as 95% Jesus and 5% something else. You know why that comes? Because the church has been in law and grace. We need to get rid of that law and we need to live in the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, all through her body, every inch of her body, in Jesus' mighty name. Let's give the Lord a praise. Would you do it with me right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the presence of Jehovah. God of mine. Come on, lift your hands in worship. Oh, Prince of Peace, troubles vanish. Hearts are in the presence I want to praise God that my brother Don is back on full duty at the fire department. That's why he's not here today. Those of you know that a saw went into, electric saw went into his fingers. I went instantly to the hospital with him. They said, we're going to have to probably remove his finger. Don said, you're not taking my finger off. And God made, started making statements of faith like I had never seen him make before. I was there. My mother was there. My wife was there. You're not going to do it. God's going to take care of it. And how many know God's done it in the name of Jesus? 36 stitches. They had to put in one finger. Think about that. God touched him and worked a miracle in the name of Jesus. Just praise him.